My name is Kyle Sanders. Uh, my firm is Legacy Consultants Group. I am one of the two financial advisors on the Sokoa 401k plan. For many of you on here, we haven't had the, the great pleasure of meeting face-to-face -face or potentially even via Zoom. So if it's the first time that we're meeting, uh, let me just say thank you to all of you, first and foremost, for two very important things. One, but thank you for the trust you place in Christine Kambalenka and myself in helping you all, whether that's a lot of contact you have with us or just simply seeing your statement each and every quarter, the trust you place in us to help you with one of the most important goals you'll have in your life, which is retiring. Um, you all are frontline serving our mainly our senior community, and you know the importance of seeing the importance or the ramifications of uh, financial readiness for retirement. So the second is thank you for see serving our underserved or underprivileged, uh, those individuals who are in need of a little extra love and care in our community. What you all do as an organization is humbling at best and inspiring, if I might say so myself. It's always been a great pleasure of mine to be connected to your organization uh, for, for many, many years now. And I have yet to meet anybody in your organization I don't think very, very highly of. So I just want to say thank you for that as well. Thank you for all that you do for others. You can't hear it enough. You all cannot hear that enough from, from all of us here in Indianapolis and in the surrounding uh, counties. So let me just say that from the bottom of my heart as well. So um, we our, our 10, we're going to spend time on what is called the 10 things every investor should know. Right. So my objective here today is to teach, uh, to educate you all. Um, you're going to see the name John Hancock, uh, your 401k is Lincoln. I'm an independent financial advisor. So we work with a lot of different financial institutions um, independently. So my goal in this event and any other subsequent events we do is to bring down what I deem to be information that is of value, that is presented in a straightforward manner that hopefully at the end of this connection and conversation, you all feel a little bit more educated, a little bit more prepared, and a little bit more clear to make quality decisions about your money and your future. So if we've been successful, that's what we'll get done today, right? So again, thank you so much for having me, and we're going to dive in as we go here. So what we're going to talk about is these 10 things, right? What's investing? How do we look at investing? What's active versus passive? How do emotions come into play? So we're going to cover all 10 of these topics during our time together. So here's a big one that I want to convey to all of you is investing may help your savings catch up with your financial goals. Now, I'm blessed to have four young children, uh, ages 10 to one and a half. And one of the most straightforward reasons that we invest is that I've got big goals. I want to retire someday. I want to send my children to college, right, and do so comfortably without, you know, me having to go back to eating ramen noodles when I was in college. And so but these are big goals and they're expensive goals. And certainly for you folks there at Sokoa, you know, like most of us, we're not making massive amounts of money, but there's tons of left over. And so what investing allows us to do is to have the opportunity to have our money grow at a rate faster than what the thing we're trying to buy for, right? Whether that's being able to cover our retirement savings uh, needs or cover our future college cost. The average single year cost, what the average retiree is spending is just a skosh over $61,000. And you see that broken down there. And we know that that's, you know, with inflation as it is, and hopefully settling down a little bit, but we know that inflation's part of everyone's life, whether that number is low or high. Um, we know that 61,334, if you're close to my age or younger, you're going to need more than that. That's a today number. We know that the cost of college is, is a meaningful nut to crack, 44000 to $55,000 a year, right? And so, you know, that's a, that's a big cost that we have to spend and, and cover college. And so how do we think about these things and how do we work towards these things? Well, one way that can certainly help bridge that is that investing can make a big difference in that. And uh, I was just talking to a, uh, somebody participating in a, in a different 401k we work with. And he said, well, yeah, but last last year, my, my account went down and I put this in and it, you know, sometimes investing is takes, it's a, it's a game of patience. It's a game of patience. And 
sometimes those statements can feel a little uncomfortable, right? That's why we're here to help you with that. So how do we figure out how long it takes to grow wealth? Well, there's this a little, a little math trick. My uh, oldest daughter doesn't love math. I can imagine that. <laughs> I got two degrees in finance. My daughter doesn't love math. It shows us we're all individuals. She reminds me of that every day. And so one of the key things I've learned is that sometimes math isn't our favorite thing to do, but these little tricks can help us a whole lot, right? Well, if I take whatever I'm growing my money at, called a rate of return, right? So if you think about your savings account for years and years and years, our savings were making almost zero, right? You get three cents a year or something like that, right? But over time, when we have our money invested in stocks and bonds, they tend to grow at a much higher rate or have historically than a savings account. So we've put that rate of return in that denominator, that bottom number, it says rate of return. And we divide that into 72. The answer tells us how long it takes money to double. Well, over the last 50 years, stocks or equities, if you will, have grown on average at 10%. So if 10% was our bottom number, it would take 7.2 years for our, num our money to double. If you have $1,000 in your 401k, didn't add anything else to it, and grew it at 10% in 7.2 years, you'd have another $1,000 is, is what that means. And so we can see is that if we increase that denominator, that new that, that denominator, our time to double decreases, right? So that's a key aspect of investing. But when we only make two and a half, right? Uh, the saver, you know, in two and a half for is the average return since 1928. It takes 28 years. But the investor, 9.73, 7.4, a big difference. So why is this critical? Because I think one of the time when we come off in uh, a year like last year when investments were a little, a little uncomfortable to be in, to make us think, should I pull my money out of the bank? I mean, out of my 401k or choose something more conservative. But we can see over a long haul, equities tend to outperform everything else and, and, and help us get to our goals. So now the good news inside your 401k is this phenomenon is done for you, what we're going to talk about. So Albert Einstein, who I consider to be a pretty bright guy, you know, um, we wouldn't be a bad thing could be compared to him. Um, but compounding interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Well, what is that? Well, we can get, we can invest money and we get paid on it. And then that what we get paid on, we reinvest it. We buy more of what was paying us money. So let's say you own Coca-Cola stock and you Coca-Cola pays you some cash called a dividend when it's a stock and you go buy my, more Coca-Cola stock. That's reinvesting the dividends and it gets us caught what's called compounding interest. And what happens is over a period of time, that represents a large part of our growth. And the higher that rate of return and the ability to reinvest that rate of return, the more our money grows for us. Now, here's a key attribute I want you to know. You said, well, Kyle, I, am I doing that? Is that something I need to do? How does that happen? Well, inside your 401k plan, that all happens automatically. You are buying a diversified portfolio. I got 40 plus people on here, so I'm not sure what everyone's invested in, but you've invested inside the 401k plan if you're eligible to participate. All of that reinvesting happens automatically for you uh, by the nature of how that plan works. So, but it's an important thing. That's what allows your money, even if it's not a ton that's going in, to help you get towards your goals in a way that most anything else would have a tough time keeping up. So investing in US stocks is one of the ways to build wealth. So, this is a pretty powerful illustration, okay? So if we went back to 1980, all right? If I got a DeLorean out, uh, for those of us old enough to know what a DeLorean is, <laughs> um, I might've just aged myself with a Back to the Future reference, but so be it. But if we go back to 1980 and we invested $100,000, and no, that's not an offer to hand you guys a time machine or a hundred grand back in 1980, but there you are is that if an individual bought just a diversified all stock portfolio, which is that green line, we can see that over time, that's a bit of a roller coaster, right? 
you can see that there's been a lot of things that have happened along the way. You've had the Iraqi invasion. We've had President Clinton impeached. I'm just grabbing some stuff off of here. The Persian Gulf War, savings and loan crises. We've this little banking thing that we just had this year isn't the first time something like that's happened, and it won't be the last time it happens. That I can tell you. We had the 2008 bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers and Washington Mutual and all of these big financial institutions, right? All of that. Your $100,000 invested in 1980 would be worth $10.1 million today. You have to say million that way or it doesn't count. However, if we just had owned bonds, which by most people's, by most measurements are safer, in most years, safer, um, we'd only have $1.7 million. And if we just invested in something that kept pace with inflation, we'd have 300000 Now, here's a key thing that I want you to take away from this. That $10 million versus the 300000 that difference is real wealth. The cost of things went up by threefold, by 100000 to 300000 But your wealth went up not tenfold, but a hundredfold. That's real wealth. You actually have increased your lifestyle, the goods, services, and experiences you can have and experience to investing. So that's a that is the big crux of why we invest. Now, does investing always uh feel good? No. Investing doesn't always feel good, right? So what we've broken down here is we've looked at that same time period, even longer actually, going back to 1928. And we said, okay, we're going to categorize all of the returns that have happened. Right. The blue means you lost money that year. Right. You opened up your statements and it didn't feel very good for a whole year. The green means that you made some money. OK. The first thing I want everyone to notice is the percentages. Seventy three percent of the time since 1929, you would have opened your statement at the end of the year and it would have made money for you. Right. I'll hear over the years, I've been an advisor for 20 years, people will reference investing like gambling. They'll say, wasn't well, investing just like gambling? Well, Vegas doesn't put anything available where the better wins three out of four times, right? They wouldn't, that wouldn't be, Vegas would have very, they wouldn't have buildings anymore if they put that out, right? They'll lose. So investing isn't like gambling at all. The longer we stay invested, even for a four year, we have better than a three out of four chance of making money out of the year. In addition to that, you'll see that when we, we really dive into this number, we see there's times where the S&P 500 or broad 500 of the largest companies in the, in the, in the United States, that portfolio of that have returned somewhere between 40 and 50% four times, where it's only lost 40 to 50% once. When we start to compare these things, not only do we have a better chance of winning, we have a better chance of having really big wins when it comes to stocks. So what we have to know when we go into investing is knows, yes, there's a chance you'd lose money, but over the long run, you're going to make more, more often. And so I, I kind of say is three out of four years, you're going to love me or Christine, or you're going to love your 401k. One out of four years, it's not going to feel so good. And I think one of the greatest ways to under to move through something that might be uncomfortable is to know it's going to happen every now and again. It doesn't come as a surprise. However, once we look at 10-year periods of time, all right, so we go back that same period of time and says, well, I'm going to go from holding stocks for one year. So what happens if I hold on to these things for 10 years? Then what happens? Well, now we look and say, okay, 94% of the time, I make money, right? 80, 80 positive 10-year windows. We're only five negative, only five negative. And, and that's, those negatives are pretty minor. And it's interesting that what they grab in, 1937, 1938, and 1939, okay, also known as the Great Depression. And many don't know this, but there was a massive amount of regulation that was passed in our securities world and investment world after that, we'll cite all of them, it'd be rather boring. And then 2008 and 2009, okay, our, what was often referred to as the Great Recession. And so there's only two very specific, specific and cataclysmic financial periods 
where if we'd bought stocks then and held for 10 years or had been in that window, it'd been a, been a problem. So we know we can have a high degree of confidence that the longer we stay invested, that we have a pretty high probability of not, not losing money. However, however, any, any given day, month, or year, you don't know what's going to happen, right? So the, the moral of this data here, right, is that when we look at investing and we look at how to, how to increase risk, if you want to feel more uncomfortable is another way to describe that, in my opinion, is that decrease the period of time that we're looking at something. And so what this chart's showing is the blue is where the stock market ended that particular year, right? The green, that light green, what's called an intra-year decline. And so you can see here is that a lot of these years where the stock market ended up positive, there was some time during that year that the stock market was negative, right? We call that a comeback in the sports world, right? We call that a comeback. We call that a ninth inning rally, right? Or whatever you want to call it, whatever your sports flavor is, right? We call that the comeback. Everyone loves the comeback story, right? So in the stock market in a single in one singular year, very often has a comeback story. There's a period where it's down in the second quarter or the third quarter, if you will, and it rallies. But if you get out, you miss out on that growth. And so what you've seen here over the last few slides is as we decrease time, we increase the likelihood of experiencing losses or decreases in value, right? And as we increase time, then we decrease that likelihood of having a negative event. I think that's interesting. Like a, a takeaway there, a golden nugget, if you will, is that you as an investor have some control over something that feels often so very uncontrollable. Is that if you lengthen your time horizon, you increase your patience and your discipline, you just decrease the likelihood of actually realizing temporary losses. So when we own stocks, quite often they pay dividends. OK, and a dividend is just cash that's paid to an investor from the company that you own. So I don't think it'll come as a big surprise that companies like Coca-Cola make a boatload of money. Right. They make a truckload on top of a boatload. They make silly amounts of money. They make so much money, they don't know what to do with it. And so what they do is in a way to reward shareholders is they send them checks. Now, if you own Coca-Cola stock inside your 401k, that check doesn't go to you directly because you would pay taxes on it. It goes, it's part of the mutual funds that you own inside your 401k plan if you have really any stock exposure at all, you guys have some Coca-Cola. Well, those checks go back into your 401k plan and you reinvest it. And what's really unbelievable, right, is how big of a difference that makes over time. And so one of the things that you say, you may walk out of this uh, event and say, well, what can I do differently? Right. Well, one thing that you can also do differently, which we'll talk about some of those things you can do differently, right, is to understand what you are doing well and be thankful for it. Right. So that has a big impact on your long term growth. OK. So international stocks can help cast a wider net. Right. So let's talk about this. I think one of the things that uh, especially uh, for those who I talk in more senior age groups, is there's a um, perception of a, a domestic only perception on well, a lot of things, including investing. And one of those things is, well, the United States has a corner in all economies, and that really isn't true. And so what this walks through is if we think about our day, right, often we're interacting with global companies. You wake up in the morning, you grab your, if you have a Samsung, right? You grab that Samsung phone, right? To check the weather at 11 o'clock, right? You drove, drove a Toyota in to work today or anywhere today. That's a Japanese company, right? If you grabbed any Nestle coffee creamer right out of the break room there on the second floor, right? You you dealt with a Swiss, or Swiss company, right? If you have a headache from all the voicemails, you got to check on your phone as, <laughs> as a social worker, I have any of you lovely folks on the phone, right? You know, you might need an aspirin, which is a, a German company, right? Um, you head on, on the way home and you fill up your tank if you were out driving today, 
We interact with Shell, right? And Anheuser-Busch, right? Budweiser is actually owned by a Belgium company. No matter how those beautiful Clydesdales might, it, you know, evoke Americana to you, that's a that is now a Belgium company. So if the day was really rough and you needed a beer at the end of the day, uh, if you will, and I, I and I can replace this with seven to eight more companies. The reality is, is that when we have our money invested globally, we have the opportunity. When we look at performance, right? There's times where the green is when this this lighter shade of green or whatever that uh, sea green, if you will, makes me think of the tropics. When that's above this line, it means that non-U.S. stocks, international stocks have done better than the S&P 500. When it's this dark blue, deeper water, right? It means that international stocks have underperformed compared to the U.S. But what we can see is they go in cycles, periods of time where international and domestic, right? That they kind of... What's the benefit of things that work more like a seesaw? Well, one's not doing as well, the other likely would be. And this is what one of the core foundational pieces of diversification is, not having your eggs in one basket, right? I, I kind of reference it as if I, you invited me all, you all invited me to a barbecue and you asked me to bring the fruit salad and I bring nothing but grapefruits and oranges and tangerines and tangelos and mandarin oranges all in one bowl, you'd be like, I thought I asked you to bring fruit salad. So, well, it's fruit. There's a lot. These are all citrus, right? Is that when we build a portfolio, we want to have blueberries, strawberries, cantaloupe, mangoes, what have you, right? And to diversify. They taste different. It's more pleasant. When we have our stocks and our investments in different kinds, they work differently. And that helps us move the ride a bit. So when we look at a global market right we look and say okay well where what do most people do well most people put things in just a little bit of equities just a little bit of diversification which shown on the right side yet the global markets have canada and the united kingdom china japan right and so we don't get enough international diversification now if you've chosen in your plan, and this is one of the things we help individuals with who have money outside the Sokoa 401k plan, but if you've chosen one of the pre-built portfolios inside your plan, then this is done for you, right? You might wonder why. This tells you why, right? Why do we have things not in all the same place? So, we look and ask, well, what's happening on a global scale? When we look at annual growth rates of wealth per adult in local currencies, right? So in, in essence, this is what this, is, this information is sharing with us, is the United States is a mature, they're, they're our age, right? They're adults, right? And if we put a growth chart up for Kyle Sanders, right, on the wall, like I got for my kids, right? I'm not growing much higher, right? If I'm growing, it's wider, not higher. That's that's the only way I'm growing these days, right? Okay. And we try not to let that happen. So, but China, Russia, Vietnam, Indonesia, India, Poland, right? These countries are growing taller. The wealth measured by wealth of citizens is growing at a pretty meaningful clip. Why is that relevant? Well, one of the ways we can help your wealth grow as the cost of living increases, as you have big goals, right? College, retirement, fill in the blank for you individually. Having your money exposed to these international markets where the wealth of the citizens are growing and the size of their economy is growing and so their investments are growing is advisable. Feel free to drop questions in the chat, by the way. So when we bring this all down, right, as we go down further, right, and we look and say, okay, what's happened here? What's happening here? All right. Diversification is, is important with international equities. Just like U.S., there's an opportunity to make money, but we want to have things not all in one basket. So having exposure to large, big 
top international companies as well as small ones are is is important as we invest. So let's talk about bonds. Let's shift away from stocks and what they can do, and let's talk about bonds. Now, I'm assuming that a, a large chunk of you drive at some point in time throughout the day, right? People often ask, well, if stocks do so well, why why would I just own, shouldn't I just own stocks? I would say, well, would you cut the brakes out of your car? Like, well, no, I would not. So, well, the accelerator will get you there faster. He's like, yeah, but the brakes get me there safer. Okay, understood. So the big reason we own bonds is because they offer more stability historically. Now, last year, bonds had a really rough year, an historically rough year. But generally speaking, right, for over the last 50 years, bonds have only lost money four times. That's it. A diversified bond portfolio, only four losses. And most of those were really, 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 really small losses, like 2 or 3%. Why is that? Well, because a bond is a promise of payment. It's a loan that you make. I'm going to loan somebody some money today. A corporation, a municipality, or a governmental agency. That's it. That's who we loan money to primarily. So we're going to have a corporate bond, a municipality bond, or a bond loaded loan where we loan money to a state or city agency, or the U.S. government or a sovereign sovereign agency. So, and they make a promise to pay you an interest rate. And that interest rate is dependent upon how credit worthy the organization you lent your money to is, right? And how long they plan to keep it. Generally speaking, the less credit worthy the person or organization you lend your money to, and the longer they're going to hold on to it, the higher the interest rate we'd expect. Okay. So if we lend money this, to a, a new company, a startup that's not very stable, we want a higher interest rate because we may not get our money back. Right. So we're going to want to be rewarded for that risk with a higher rate. They're going to hold on to it for a long period of time. I don't get my, my 10 grand back. I'm going to want you to pay me a higher interest rate as well. Those bond payments, those interest payments, the stability of them, and a, some other rules that are probably bore everyone here, may, is what makes bonds more stable from a principal perspective. So when we look and say, okay, what happens in bonds? And what can happen is that we talk about interest rate sensitivity and credit sensitivity, risk of them not paying back, right? That's that's the reality of the bond. With a stock, the company can go out of business. With bonds, they can fail to give you back your principal, what you lent them, right? And so when we look and say a the US government, well, we'd hope the US government pays you back, right? If they don't pay you back, we got big problems, right? That's not so good for the economy or any of us. If they can't pay their debts. We're all in trouble, right? Um, or banks, we've learned in recent months, right? Uh, if you read those sorts of headlines, they cannot pay you back. There's some certain risk there, right? So when we look and say, okay, again, here's another type of risk that exists in, in investing in portfolios. How do we how do we manage that? I don't think the word's going to probably survive, surprise you. It's always through the filter of diversification, okay? So when we look and say, okay, what's happened in, in the debt world, right? As interest rates have come down, right? So the U.S. interest rates have come down and down and down and down and down, right? So where do we think that's headed? What does that mean for all of us, right? So the, U the U.S. government's been able to borrow a lot of money at low interest rates, are we going to stay that way for a long time? These are questions I can't answer, right? But it does tell us that having our, our bonds professionally managed as things change is probably a wise idea. So what does this all do? All right. This orange, this kind of in between here, if you, this is called a periodic table of bonds. They have this for stocks as well is that this orange or whatever color you want to call that, I call that an orange, mustard maybe. You know, I wouldn't want that color on my white shirt, that's for certain. Well, you can see that that never reaches the top and it never reaches the bottom of this chart. What diversification does, whether it's with stocks, whether it's with bonds, is that it evens out, it brings the highs lower and the lows higher. It evens out the, the, the ride. 
So bonds do have risk, but by having a diversified bond portfolio, we can smooth that out a bit. So let's talk about alternative investments, if we will. Now, that sounds like a fancy thing, an alternative investment. What is that? It's an alternative to a stock or bond. That's really it. For you, it's funny. When I first heard of that in college, what's an alternative investment? I'm like, sounds really fancy. And then somebody made it simple for me. So I do my best to make it simple for others. So what, what this is looking at is when we own stocks, right? And things go crazy, right? And there's times the stock market loses its mind. There's no other way to put it. It absolutely loses its mind. There's times where the stock market will move plus or minus 2%, right? In a day, not in a year, but in a singular day, right? And so we can see that there's periods of time where that didn't just happen once a year, but it happened 50, 60, 70 times in a singular year. That will give you indigestion. If you're watching it a lot, that is a Pepnobismal moment galore, period, right? So, and I'm not going to cite each and every one of these, but what happens during these periods of time is that when things completely lose their mind, right? Historically, these asset classes don't act the same, right? We can smooth out the road by uh, having quality diversification. But that when the stock market loses its mind, often a lot of other asset classes will follow suit, okay? But we can see that it, this is in 2008 as an example, right? We call it a year where there's no, very few places to hide, okay? So, what does, and I'm going to sh show you stuff, some stuff here in a minute. So if we lose 10%, this is showing a 7% yearly return. How long does it take to get our money back? So if we take a 30% loss in our portfolio and our average return is seven years, 7% takes six years just to get back to even six years. So why does this matter? When we look and say, okay, what are some things we can do to mitigate this? Is that we have a diversified portfolio that brings in alternative assets. We can do this a couple ways, right? So a algorithmically managed portfolio, this is one of the things that Stadian's doing for all of you that are in Stadian, is for those who use that sort of strategy, it gets you out when things get crazy, when diversification breaks, right? We run for the sidelines and hide. You know, I always use... I describe stadium to me as, you know, we all drive down the highway and it can rain hard enough for most of us that we pull over and get that cup of coffee, right? We all have different degrees of rain we're willing to tolerate before we pull off on the side road. What stadium does is it gets you off the highway when the weather gets too bad. That's one way to manage and prevent those big losses. Another is to add what's called alternative assets into a portfolio. Things like gold, uh, global real estate, um, um, bonds issued by emerging company countries like India. And what correlation shows, what this correlation measurement says is when the rest of the world's going crazy, right? This stuff isn't, right? So think of that teeter-totter, right? Correlation is I can predict what this does, right? By looking at the other end of the teeter-totter. One, I can predict what something's going to do by looking at something different. That's what correlation is. It's not a word we use very often. By having assets that are not like stocks and bonds, we can have some more stability. All right. This is probably one of my favorite slides. So if I put you to sleep, wake back up. Good to see you all. We, just in my 20 years of being a financial advisor, there's been some crazy stuff happening. Right. There seems to every time I flick on the news or something crazy. OK, so this is looking to say, OK, the fall of France. Right. Going back to World War Two, the collapse of Lehman Brothers. That was a scary one. I can tell you that was on a Tuesday. That's how nuts that was. I can tell you what day of the week that was. So what happened as a result of that? The pa COVID pandemic. Right. I'll never forget. I'm home with my kids. 
right? My son was supposed to march in the St. Patty's Day parade um, and they canceled that. And I said, well, hey, you know, I love our yard. It's a beautiful time of year. The worst thing I had to do is stay home for a couple of weeks. This isn't too bad. <laughs> Not so much, right? So that's the loss during the event. The stock market dropped 33.79% in that, not months, days, days. One month later, it already recovered 25%. One year later, up 77%, right? Is that often we'll see these events and think, oh my gosh, I need to get out. And the reality is, is typically when the equity markets lose money due to just a one-time event, the best thing to do is stay invested or if you have the cash, buy more. So again, this is looking at it from a different angle. Bank and credit crisis, the dot-com crash. Everyone remember 2020 and the, the 2000, I mean, uh, 2000 dot-com, all that jazz, the year Y2K. Golly gee willikers, I'm aging myself, aren't I? And yes, I say golly gee willikers all the time with my young kids. It's hilarious. If you've never seen a four, heard a four-year-old say golly gee willikers, you have not lived. Um, anyways, I digress. We look at this and say, what happened? What happened? What was a smart thing to do? And can we learn anything from that? And what you see with each one of these events, the smartest thing you should have done is done nothing. To not worry. To stay invested consistently. Now, this is one that I think is always hard for me to help people understand. The stock market moves very quickly in a blink, in a blink. And so the question we get a lot is, well, should I get out and get back in? And well, you know, when something's going funny, right? When things are going not so well, when COVID hit the fan, if you will, or when Lehman went bankrupt, right? All this stuff, I've, I've been asked this question a lot over the years. And I said, yeah, let's just make sure we don't miss any good days. And they said, well, how do you do that? I don't know. You can't. If you, over 20 years, over a 20-year window, okay, from 2001 to 2021, if you just missed the 10 best days in a 20-year window, we're just missing 10 days, your 10,000, instead of going to 41,000, only grows to 18,998. If you missed the 20 best days, your rate of return goes to, only, now we're down to 11,300. Missed the 30, missed the 40. You can see that that's over a 20 year window, 20 year window, seven, over 7,000 days. I missed 10 of them and my rate of return drops in over half, All right? So what, what that teaches us is the market moves quickly, all right? Anytime I have 40 people in the room on a WebEx, I can suffice to say that there are Republicans, there are Democrats, there are independents, there are conservatives, there are liberals. There's people of all kinds of beliefs and perspectives, and none of them, in my opinion, are wrong. They're not wrong. They're just part of your journey and how you see life, right? It's, that's my opinion. But one of the things that we'll hear a lot is, what about XYZ politician, right? This person got elected. Oh my gosh, should I stay invested, right? We're having an election coming up. By oh, golly gee, should we get it? stay invested? I think you're catching the moral of the story, all right? So we do this in better periods of time. So we're in this midterm year, right? We just got done with an election. Uh, my favorite time is this window because there's no political advertisements on the television. It's my favorite window of time. Uh, so, but we see these post-election and midterm years right now, right? This is the, you know, and there's, we can see that there's negative years in all these years, right? And so there isn't a big difference, in my opinion, between when we choose to be invested. This is my favorite. Democrats or Republicans? Who's better to be invested in, right? Well, so if we look at, say, okay, going back to Roosevelt, right? And their term and rates of return and cumulative return and all this stuff. We calculate this out. We shake it all down, right? Biden, right? We even have Biden's a little window here, right? We shake all that down. 
And the average for Republicans, 6.3. The average for Democrats, 7.8. Come back in 10 years, that'll flip, right? And another 10 years, that's a flip, right? So for those Democrats on, on this, you, you guys got the edge right now. Congratulations, right? I've done this for 20 years. This changes and makes very little difference, right? And I could talk about that why. So what do we do about all this, right? Is it, if we look and say, okay, what does diversification do? Diversification is called the one free lunch in investing. Holding a broad mix of assets that don't move up in lockstep can help reduce your portfolio's risk without sacrificing potential returns. Among other benefits, diversification helps to ensure that you don't have too much of your portfolio in the worst performing asset classes. We don't know what those are going to be before the year starts. Financial markets are unpredictable at best. The best performing asset classes one year may be the worst following the next year, vice versa. So if you contrate your investments in one small number of investment types, you absolutely run the risk that poor performance by one or two asset classes will decimate what you build. By contrast, diversification helps you protect you from trouble in any one kind of investment. It's also important to note that diversification doesn't guarantee profit or eliminate the risk of loss. We're mitigating loss chances, not eliminating. Those are really big difference in words. So in some years, traditional diversification doesn't work well. That's not always the case, however. 2008, every type of U.S. fund posted large losses. In 2011-12, the gaps between the best and worst types of funds were 8.1 to 3.9, respectively. And so what that says is there's times diversification breaks just doesn't do what it's supposed to do. But for the most part, but in other years, past decade, the difference between the best and worst performing asset classes was dramatic. For example, in 2021, the best performing asset class was mid-cap value. Did extremely well, over 30%. Well, the worst performing asset class, mid-cap growth, had a return of 25% less. So there's a 25% spread. Since Tim's like these, we recognize owning anything wasn't going to work. Non-traditional asset classes, so stocks post strong returns during the vast majority of the 10-year periods over the last century. There were a few exceptions, however, including a recent one. The S&P 500 posted a 1% annual loss during the 10 years through 2009. So that's one of those 10-year windows. Keep in mind, non-traditional asset classes can play a role during difficult stretches like that one. The REITs, we talked about gold, those things. As you can see, assets such as real estate, natural resources, emerging markets post strong returns during the same period. Investors who had some exposure to those type of investments had a degree of protection from the lost decade, what's, what's often referred to as that lost decade. So this is a look at it at some different asset mixes, okay? So in general, the longer you have until you need your money, generally speaking, the more aggressive right? The more risk you can afford to, in pursuit of growth. That means holding relatively large allocations of various kinds of stocks and relatively small allocation and bonds, also called fixed income, if you hear those two things. So when we think of that portfolio you've built with us inside Sokoa, if you've got a short period of time, we're going to want to be conservative. Relatively large allocation to fixed income and only a small allocation to stocks. Stadian kind of does this for you automatically if you if you use Stadian, not trying to promote it over anything else, but just as an example. But what we can see is, is this, this spread, okay? Why is this so relevant and why is this so important? Is because there's not a one size fit all when it comes to portfolios. We should own what is safe for us, okay? And what's right for us. So, when we look at um, timing can make a big, big difference. So this is an example of a hypothetical returns over a 30 year period of time. So this chart is meant to show that if you are heavily invested in equities and retire when the market's not doing well, your portfolio may never recover. All right. So this is what's called sequence of returns. And so one of the things is we get close to retirement. That's so, super important. So investor A, that green bar, is somebody retires when stock market's doing well. The B or that darker blue is when the stock market has not or does not start very well. The difference 
is that investor A lives a 30 years of retirement and leaves their family more money than they started with. And investor B is living in the grandkids' basement. <laughs> For lack of better descriptors, I don't mean to laugh about that. Sometimes I'll laugh at my own jokes. Um, so my statement in that reality is that when you turn 65 and what's going on in the economy can matter a ton. Well, what decides when you turn 65? Well, it's the year where you were born, which I pretty hard thing to control your birthday, right? We can control a lot of things, but that's when most of us, I don't think any of us have control over that one. So the relevance to this is that making sure that we have the right amount of risk as we approach retirement is critical. If an individual has too much risk and suffers a meaningful loss in their investments, that can be a tough thing to recover from. All right. We're on principle number eight out of 10. You're all doing great. Almost everyone's still with me. So I don't know if this is jokes. I don't know if this is exciting for all of you, but thanks for sticking around so far. We've got a couple more principles to go. Um, let me check the chat. No one. So fire those questions away, please. If you have any, you've got my contact information. If you have anything offline, active and passive strategies can play an important role. What does that even mean? Okay. Well, let's talk about the two different. Okay. And why am I talking about these? Because you have them both. Oh, yay. We have a question. Definitely the jokes. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. So you say something nice. I'm going to say your name as a thank you. So I'm glad you like the jokes. <laughs> so active versus passive. What does this mean? Okay. Well, sometimes in finance, we use words in their little, in their little explanation. They're, they're, we can take a little uh, understanding of that word, right? So if somebody's active right? They're moving around, they're doing things, right? So an active portfolio is professionally managed. Somebody, somebody's, you know, a group of women and men are making choices about your portfolio on your behalf. Um, and their goal is to win. What do you mean by win? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a random statement, right? Well, winning in this context means I'm going to perform better than some sort of benchmark. Maybe that's S&P 500 or other benchmark, or I'm going to do as well as that does. I'm going to earn as much, but I'm going to do it with less risk, right? My portfolio is going to do less of this, right? So a lot of the investments inside your Sokoa 401k plan are actively managed. The, the most actively managed being stadium. Passive means I'm caught, I'm price conscious. So it's there's usually less cost associated with these kind of funds. And I'm just one, I want to own the S&P 500 or the Barclays Aggregate Bond Index or fill in the blank. My goal is just to match the index performance and I'll just go along for the ride. Which one's better? Well, the answer is both. They both silver rule. So active management can mitigate risk. Stadium is a great example of that. We can have a potential for outperformance. We can have access to some niche areas if appropriate, right? Passive can drive costs lower. We can, it's more transparent typically. So we know if you have an S&P 500 index fund, we could just go look what the 500 fund uh, companies are in the S&P 500 and that's what you own, right? So very easy. There's no single person. OK, that's a key one. Right. One of these mutual funds can be ran by, you know, an absolute brilliant female who's just crushing it. And she decides to go someplace else. Now, how well it's going to do. Right. That's that's key. I'm, I'm a big soft women's softball fan. Right. Montana Fouts, one of the best pitchers in the nation. When she graduates this spring from the University of Alabama, how well is university? How is how well is the University of Alabama softball team going to look like? Right. Same concept here. But instead of pitching fastballs, this isn't making investment choices, okay? So people can be beneficial, but mutual fund managers have a right to change. So this is just to look at where money's going. So passive investment has had a significant growth in, in market share. So a lot of folks over recent years said, should we own passives, we own back active and people kind of own them both. So, and for us as advisors, it's kind of funny. 
I don't like to, I don't like to go with the crowd. I like to see, think of myself as an individual, but, but I'm not in this space, right? Active, passive, a blend of both. So our organization has an investment philosophy. There's a time in someone's life that each one of these serves well. We have that written and defined that we share with our individual clients. This is when we should have active. This is when we should have passive. These are the time horizons. These are the goals and objectives. These are tied to, okay? And so to me, they both serve a role. It just depends on what our vision and goal and desired outcomes are. I know I sound a bit like a commercial, but that one absolutely resonates in that space. One thing we do know is the cost of owning investments has come down and continues to come down over time, right? You're like, wait a minute, I thought there was inflation. There is. This is one of the few places there's actually been more deflationary pressures. So what's happened is that the cost of owning funds have come down, right? And the types of funds that we own make a difference. So what, what that means is that when we the, um, the more money an investment has a probability of making, the higher the cost of owning that, that fund typically is. So stock funds, international stock funds, tend to be more expensive than bond funds. So why is that? Well, bonds tend to be safer. So the amount of research that the folks have to do to decide whether owning bonds, right, a particular bond is safe to invest in, is a whole lot less than, than the stock. Because the stock's got a higher probability of going to zero. So I got to do more research. And people don't work for free. So especially in Wall Street. <laughs> so what we've seen, though, is that in recent years, this was what I was referencing before, in recent years, the cost of owning investments in general, including in your 401k plan, since we've been managing it, we've brought the cost of your 401k plan down multiple times, even including this year as well. So the reality is why do financial advisors recommend a blend of active and passive, passive right? As a refresher, as passive funds are a simple way to achieve market exposure at low cost. So generally speaking, for investments outside of 401k plans, we often recommend having uh, those lower cost index funds when someone's younger, right? So the reason is that while index-based investing offers benefits, traditional investing methods can lead to certain problems, all right? So this is one of the things that I think is so important to know is that if we own the index and there's no active management, when things go well, go, go well, nobody can get you out or make those changes. All right. This is this is the tough talk. You gotta have the tough talk. Emotions can be your worst enemy. All right. And I know this. I get this. This is candidly one of my favorite parts of what I do for people is to help people understand how to manage and emotionally regulate. As I mentioned, I have four young kids, right? My four-year-old woke up two days ago and she wanted to go into her little brother's room who's 18 months old. She was very upset about it. And eventually I just stopped responding. I encouraged my wife to do the same. Let her figure it out. Let her emotionally regulate. But the reality is, is that most investors have the emotional bandwidth of a four-year-old, right? I don't mean that as a negative thing. It's just, it, it's our future and it can scare you. So Human's nature is to feel emotion about your investment, but act on your emotions in really counterproductive ways. So one of the things I want to talk about is that if we can step back out of our emotions and say, okay, what, what are we doing? Well, what this is looking at is equity fund flows. So see this, this blue, these highlighted parts, right? Is that investors flee stocks in 2008. The average hold time on Fidelity was eight hours in October 2008 when the market was eight hours, right? I can't even watch Netflix that long if I didn't have kids. I can't, I can't I can barely do anything for eight hours. But people are waiting on hold for eight hours to sell out, right? And then as the market started to recover, they, they, as they finally started, well, look at what the market had done in that window when they finally started getting back in. All that money they lost, all those gains they lost, right? Here's COVID. COVID, right? And then COVID recovery. They sold in March and bought in September of the year 2020. We're crazy, investor. So here's 
what we can see is if we can understand that, we can understand that that's how we're going to feel and not to do anything, you will outperform most of your peers. All right, stay the course. The average an equity investor, because of choices that they've made, underperforms the index fund, okay? Because they buy and sell and buy and sell and get in and get out and get in and get out, right? Every four years, they're changing something, right? They never let it get going for them, right? But remember, we talked about the 10-year window and we hold something for 10 years, the better of a chance we have of making money but the average investor is only holding what they own for four. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping the most of you aren't average because of that. So here's what's interesting. The longer we hold money, look at this, 10 years, average rate of return, 16 and a half, 29 and a half, 25, 9.7, 30 years, 10.6, 35. The longer we hold money, look at this. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Great years are not un that uncommon, right? Calendar years, right? This is the biggest thing I, I want to, one big point I want to, is that you hear investors, advisors say, well, the average rate of return you should get is eight to 12. Uh-huh, average, not that common. So calendar years of eight to 12 have only occurred four times in 94 years. The stock market is a market of extremes, extreme to the positive and sometimes extreme to the negative. It's not a comfortable ride. So when we look and say, but what about great performance? There's been 34 times of the market's return more than 20%. So what that tells us, right, is that the equity markets, the stock market is a market of extremes. And we get somewhere. No, I didn't make this slide. I can I just I, I didn't make the slide. Okay. Just just don't blame me. Okay. I didn't I didn't my presentations are regulated. Okay. I would never write this. I, you know, now if one of you said this, I'd say thank you. That would be a nice thing to say. So if somebody wants to put that in the chat, that'd be you're welcome to do so. But I would never write that. Here's what I'm gonna tell you. Okay. These things are true has been through trying markets before. I've done this for 20 years. I started actually investing when I was in the eighth grade. I used to get shoved into lockers a lot. I am a geek, right? For certain, okay? I've made my poor kids listen to investor calls at the dinner table. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I've listened to earning calls at the dinner table. I'm a weird guy. It's just who I am, okay? You can thank my grandfather for that. That's a story for another day, right? Sometimes it feels better to be with somebody who's been through something before, right? can help you make a plan and stick to it, right? That last one matters, right? It's discipline that gets you to where you want to go. Planning's easy. Discipline's hard, right? That stuff on the wall is from running ultra marathons. I ran 50 miles in one day, right? Discipline is one of my favorite things. To me, it's the key to freedom. You guys know as much as I do when your plan needs to involve because your life changes, Right? And I can help somebody protect themselves from themselves, right? I also call that as stop you from doing stupid. Just a little bit more direct, <laughs> right? We don't have to be smarter than the rest. We have to be more disciplined than the rest, all right? Now, I just gave you 10 key things, right? I probably could have done this whole presentation with one slide, right? People like slides. I like directness, right? Is that the reality is, is that the results of your life will come to the, how well disciplined you are with the things you care about. Do you keep investing in whatever you're investing in? Do you stay the course when it feels uncomfortable? When you go to retire, do you stay disciplined to your budget, both now and to the future? Discipline will drive your results. So we've recorded this for all of your benefit, okay? So if there's anything that I went over too quickly, uh, feel free to replay this. We'll be sending it out. Um, you have my contact information in the chat. So certainly feel free to use that. I hope that these 10 slides in this hour of your time that you've been so gracious to invest with me has helped you understand investing a little bit better. 
If so, email HR, let them know you thought this was an investment, a valuable investment of your time. If you have any personal individual questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. I'd be happy to answer those for you. There's, you know, I questions are, are easy to answer and are part of what you pay for in the fees inside your plan. So we are available for you at your leisure. So one, I want to just say again, I want to thank you, each and every one of you. I'm chatting here for just a second. Should there be any questions? All right. So if there's any other questions, drop them in the chat. Um, otherwise, I'll give it just a second in case someone's typing. Okay. Well, thank you again so much for spending part of your day with me. I truly appreciate it. Always an honor to connect with all of you. I wish you all a beautiful rest of your day. Get out and enjoy some sunshine. It's great for your health. And I hope to see everyone soon. Have a blessed day.